I'm so excited to announce that it is officially here. Real Food for Fertility, my brand new book that I co-authored with Lily Nichols. If you're ready to embark on the incredible journey of motherhood, there's no time like the present to prepare your body for the most vital role it will ever play, the creation of new life. In Real Food for Fertility, we explore the power of nutrition to optimize your fertility and ensure a healthy start for your future child. But this book isn't just about nutrition. We delve into topics like the menstrual cycle, fertility awareness, birth control, stress management, toxins, artificial reproductive technology, and the most common reproductive health challenges affecting your fertility. Let Real Food for Fertility be your roadmap and trusted companion as you take the first step toward building your family. In a world where more couples are facing fertility challenges, your nutrition and lifestyle choices can make all the difference. Head over to realfoodforfertility.com for additional details. You can grab a copy of our book on Amazon. We currently have our paperback and ebook versions. And of course, we will be working on our audiobook version in the near future. And we'll keep you posted as to when that is available. So again, realfoodforfertility.com. And let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 512. Today, I'm excited to share the third part in the three-part series we have been going through, basically addressing that question of how does the pill impact fertility? In our first episode in the series, we looked at how the pill impacts the menstrual cycle specifically. How long does it take the menstrual cycle to normalize post-pill? In our second episode, we took a deep dive into how the pill affects ovarian function and how long it takes your ovaries to normalize post-pill. And in today's episode, we're asking a different question. We're looking at how does the pill impact fertility? Specifically, does the use of contraceptives potentially delay time to pregnancy? And as we did in the previous two episodes today, we are taking a look at what the research has to say. And so in today's research study that we're looking at, this is something I alluded to in either one or both of the previous episodes. But when you're looking at research on the pill and how it impacts fertility, the most common type of study that you find is a study that provides you with the kind of summary results of the total overall impact of fertility on an annual basis. So typically, the more recent studies that I've looked at will simply give you what the overall percentage of conception was in a year, and that's how they look at it. And so they're very easily able to say, you know, the pill is a reversible contraceptive method, and X percentage of women successfully conceived within a year, and then finished, done, and it looks great, you know, on paper. But it's harder to find a more nuanced study that actually takes the information, the the fertility statistics, and lists it on a month to month basis so that we get a sense of, okay, well, you're saying X number of women conceived within a year of coming off of contraceptives, but how many of those conceived in month one and month two and month three? And it may not seem like a big deal, I think, in the research world, because I think when we're looking at data like that, from the research standpoint, it makes sense to categorize it like that. But because I'm in the weeds with my clients on a daily basis, it's a really significant difference for somebody to be conceiving in the first two months coming off of contraceptives versus the 11th or 12th month, especially when the expectation was that we would come off contraceptives and conceive immediately after a lifetime of being told that we could conceive on every single day. So in today's study, we're looking at a research paper that breaks it down month to month. And like I said, this is not an easy thing to find. And I really hope that we will start to see more of this type of research, especially with uh, some of the more recent studies that are coming out.
I actually want to start by reading something from the study, which I find interesting. And so in the introduction of the study, the, the researchers are actually kind of giving their general sentiment. So they're talking about how even though the majority of couples do desire children at some point, it's really common for them to delay this until they've established themselves in their relationship and career, etc., which I think is something we can all relate to. And this is interesting, to embark on many years of contraception, not knowing what effect this can have on the ability to conceive can cause concern. Young women may approach contraception with an ambivalent attitude because of this underlying desire to guarantee and prove their fertility. So I think it's interesting that they use the word ambivalent because this is, it really resonates. Because we're not provided with a complete information on anything related to our fertility. And because the attitude toward contraceptive use is so cavalier, we're not really looking at this critically, and we're not really provided with the the tools even to do so. The study is called, Is Previous Use of Hormonal Contraception Associated with a Detrimental Effect? on subsequent fecundity. (laughs) These study titles are definitely, they they leave something to be desired. But in the study, they surveyed almost 3,000 women and they looked at how their choice of contraception impacted their time to pregnancy. So from when they stopped using contraceptives and started trying for pregnancy, how long it took them to conceive. And what's interesting about this study is that they compared a variety of contraceptive methods. So they compared the non-hormonal method, condoms. <laughs> they looked at the most common birth control pills, so the combined oral contraceptive. And again, combined just means that they're using the combination of synthetic estrogens and progestins. They looked at the progestin only pill. They looked at the IUD, the hormonal IUD. They looked at the shot and they looked at the implant. And so when they, when you're taking a peek at this study, they're actually breaking down how long it took for these women to conceive after coming off. And so, you know, these types of studies are really helpful and important. And this is why I wanted to break this series into three parts so that we could really look at this question of how does the pill impact fertility? Because what I was stressing in the first two parts of the series is that we can look at the impact on ovaries, we can look at the impact on the menstrual cycle, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's going to come off the pill and not conceive. So we also have to look at how the pill impacts time to pregnancy specifically But I think it's important to look at all three of those pieces and and think about what we can learn from it. So in this case, when they looked at women who were using condoms, so they were not using hormonal methods, their cycles were not affected by any type of artificial hormone. On average, it took about four months for these women to conceive naturally. And that's in line with just the general information. You know, your average healthy couple has about a 25% chance of conception per cycle. And so that that's right in line with the average that we are aware of. And so when women were coming off of the oral contraceptive, so the combined oral contraceptive pill, it actually took twice as long compared to the women who were using condoms. So compared to the condom users, when women came off of the contraceptive pill, it took them twice as long. It took about eight months instead of four months. And some of the other data I'll list and share with you here, the progestin-only pill took about six months. So it took about 50% longer. So instead of the four months, it took six months on average to conceive. The IUD was eight months. So it was it was in line with the results for the combined oral contraceptive. And whenever I talk about the pill and its impact on fertility, I think one of the questions I get the most is, well, what about the IUD and what about this and that? And I think that it's important to remember that when we're looking at hormonal methods, they're not all the same, but they're, they have similarities. And I think with the IUD, there's a specific question around that because of the way that it's marketed and promoted and the way that medical professionals talk about it. So with the IUD, in particular, women are told all of these interesting things. They're told that it's low dose. They're told that it is localized. So they're told that when you insert a hormonal ID, IUD into the uterus, that the hormones stay in the uterus and they just they just hang out there. And that's interesting because when I put 
lotion on my skin, if that lotion has in parabens or chemicals, those chemicals go all throughout my bloodstream because I have a circulatory system. Yet somehow you expect me to believe that if I put a hormone releasing device inside my uterus, that the hormones are just going to stay right in there. So that's a huge myth that is, is absolutely essential to bust. And so it's important to note that the IUD is the hormonal IUDs. So like the Skylas and the Marinas and, and other brands, those are hormonal methods. And so they have hormonal effects similar to other hormonal methods like the pill. And there's absolutely no, I don't even understand how it's possible that medical health professionals with degrees are telling women that the hormones just say in the uterus, it makes literally no sense. And it's completely incorrect, obviously. And all you have to do is look at the side effect profile and speak to a couple women, you know, anywhere from five to 10 women who've ever used the IUD to share their experience to know that the hormonal impact and side effects are very similar to that of the pill. So that was a bit of an aside, but I think it's worth saying. So in this particular study, back to the study, the women who came off of the hormonal IUD, it took a similar amount of time to conception uh, compared to the oral contraceptive pill. And if we want to look at the specific numbers, you know, the average for the contraceptive pill was 7.7 months, and then there was a range, and the average for the IUD was 8.4 months. So even, I, I share that because it was actually slightly longer statistically. It doesn't really matter, but for anyone who's kind of curious, I just wanted to put that out there. So the shot fared the worst of all of the options, and I think that that is really important to to note. So the shot took anywhere from 15 to 18 months. Women who had discontinued using the shot, it took them the longest to conceive. Um, and in this particular study, the implant was somewhere in between because on average it was taking about 10 months. So this is important information. You know, this is really useful for us to know because essentially it's showing us that hormonal contraceptives, they are a reversible method of birth control and our fertility does return. But what they're not telling us is that there's this temporary period of subfertility. And so within those averages, obviously some women conceived sooner and others conceived later. But the whole point of the series is to empower us with this information so that we can make choices. So if you think about it, if we were to do a survey, which would be great, I would be so curious to do it. But if we were to do a survey and survey like 2000 women, who were trying to conceive and so shared this information with them and then asked them, you know, knowing this information now, would that have changed the way that you approached coming off of contraceptives? Now, for many, it wouldn't because there's women who would have, there's a range. So some women would have come off of them earlier anyways and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we looked at 2000 hormonal contraceptive users, you know, it'd be really interesting to see, like, we share this information and ask them afterwards, you know, would this change how you would approach coming off of contraceptives if you had known all of this information? So the way it affects the cycle, the way it affects ovaries, and the way that it affects fertility in general, and this potential delay in the return of fertility. I think that a lot of women would adjust how they would approach it with this information. That's the whole point. You know, if we know that this could have an effect. It doesn't mean that we're talking down the pill. It doesn't mean we're saying women shouldn't have access. I think everyone kind of needs to relax. I do feel that there was a time, to, you know, when I first started the podcast and during like the early 2000s, I think there was a lot more outrage when people questioned the pill and talked about it critically and looked at some of the side effects. There was all these, you know, people that would come out of the woodwork and like, you're anti-feminist and you're trying to, you know, revoke access and that, things like that. And there's still a little bit of that out there. But I think that we've gotten to the point where we can have these nuanced discussions about contraceptives and and not have it be this thing of like, like everyone being so reactive, because these are real problems. And when, you know, my version of feminism would mean that it would also support fertility and, and mothers and wanting to have children. So equally giving you the, cho the choice to um, not build your family when you're not ready and to build your family when you're ready and to not only give you that choice, but to help you to optimize your fertility so that you can really be aware of the different contributing factors and then make choices so that you can set yourself up for the best possible result. And the best possible result would be that when you're ready to have a baby, you would conceive easily and naturally without you know, difficulty and without having to seek support, which we are thankful that we have artificial reproductive technology. But I think for a lot of women, it's not necessarily what they like their their ideal, like it's not necessarily their first choice for for conception, you know, they'd rather just have that happen naturally, if at all possible. 
And that's where this information leads us to. Another important an interesting piece of the study is that they divided the users into what they termed short-term versus long-term use. And in this particular study, they defined long-term use as two or more years. And when they divided the groups into short-term and long-term, that's when we started to see more of a variation in terms of how long it took women to return fertility. So the information I shared with you, the statistics, those were the averages. So if we looked at the contraceptive pill, women who had used it short-term, so two years or less, so under two years, the result was similar to the women who had stopped using the condom. So if you use the pill for a year or six months, in this particular study, those women did, the average time to pregnancy was about four to five months compared to the average, which was eight months. And similarly with, I think another thing to point out, because the injection had the longest time to pregnancy. So even with short-term use, the shot uh, on average took about nine months. So women who who stopped using the shot, even after what they termed short-term use, which was under two years, on average, it still took nine months to conception. And then for long-term use, it was 19 months. So women who use the shot for more than two years, they were in the 19 month territory in terms of the average time it took to conceive. And again, this information is not something that's always broken down, not always shared, and and potentially many health practitioners aren't necessarily made aware of it. Because like I mentioned, a lot of these studies are simply looking at the one year total and if, if this study was structured like that, it would look a lot different. You know, how many women conceived in a year of coming off of contraceptives? You know, like that, that would have been a different conversation. But when we break it down, you can see that it, it's really impactful. Popping into today's episode with an incredible resource to share. Today's episode is brought to you by my top resource for women's health professionals, how to interpret virtually any chart your client throws at you. Our new ebook breaks down complex chart interpretation into an easy step-by-step process. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash chart to snag your complimentary copy today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash chart. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. Interestingly, of all the hormonal methods, the method that had the least negative impact on the return of fertility was the progestin only pill. So in this study, the short term use when women used for two years or less, their the time for time to pregnancy on average was four months. So in line with condom use. And for long term use, it was five months. So interestingly, in this particular study, the progestin only pill had the most favorable result. And if anyone is curious or has looked into progestin only pills, um, unfortunately, they don't have the same degree of efficacy as the combined horm- hormonal contraceptive pills. But it is something to be aware of. It's, in, it's interesting that, that that was the result that they found. And so the way that the researchers concluded the study, you know, they said based on the above results, it appears that the contraceptive methods that act primarily by ovarian suppression, such as the combined pill and and the, the shot, might have a transient residual negative effect on subsequent fertility, particularly in the women who already have potentially compromised ovarian function. They go on to say that overall contraceptive users should be reassured that the effect on their latter fertility is small. I think that it's it's interesting to, to, to kind of just reflect on, on what the data shows. So it is important to stress that, again, there's no research to indicate that any of these results are permanent. So it's not, we're not sitting here in, in, a, in a state just terrified at the impact on, of the pill on our fertility. I think that the reason that I like to highlight this specific piece of the conversation so frequently, so strongly, I guess you could say, is that I know the psychology of women coming off birth control to conceive. This question of when to have a baby is a very complicated one. 
And it, it's something that for many of us takes years and years of planning, preparation, and a little bit of kismet. When we are, when are we going to meet the partner? When are, when is everything going to sort itself out? When are we going to have the financial resources? When is my relationship going to be stable? When am I going to feel ready to have children? And in this current day and age that we live in, we really are waiting for a lot of these things to align in order for us to feel comfortable enough to start our families. And we're also told nothing about our fertility. So we're kind of taking it for granted that when we're ready, we're just going to be able to have a baby. And this is how we go about our lives. And the bigger question, the bigger thing that's pushed in our early 20s, late teens is, is birth control because we're told that we can get pregnant all the time. And so we, we're, we're always on defense there. We're always on defense about you know pre- preventing, 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 because of course we're assuming it's just going to happen. And so when we are entering into conception with that mindset, and, and there's no balance, it's not like we've also been told about how to be offensive about this. Like, for anyone who's like missing my sports, you know, analogies here, like when you're on offense, like you're planning ahead, like you're, you know, it's it's not the same. Like when you're on defense, you're just planning for how do I prevent? How do I prevent? But you're not thinking about, well, how do I prevent, but also preserve my fertility and put myself in an optimal position so that when I'm ready, I can just go ahead and like switch it up. And, you know, that's from my perspective, where fertility awareness really comes in. Because for women for whom that is an option, you know, not everybody is necessarily wanting to do fertility awareness. I think that many women naturally gravitate to fertility awareness when they really resonate with that idea of charting their cycles, understanding their body. And not everybody necessarily wants to go there. But for women who gravitate to this idea and resonate with this idea, then it really provides this third option. You know, it provides this option where we can still actively avoid pregnancy. We can learn as much about our bodies. We can learn a specific fertility awareness-based method. We can understand the rules. We can know that the symptothermal method has been shown to be, you know, upwards of 99.4% effective when used correctly. So that can really give us that confidence that we need to be able to trust in this non-hormonal kind of non-conventional birth control method. And what's interesting about it is you can prevent pregnancy while simultaneously optimizing your fertility. So you can do both at the same time. So you're handling the defense part of it by being really intentional about how you use the method, understanding how to manage your fertility, understanding what to do in that fertile window to make sure that you're not putting yourself at risk of an unplanned pregnancy to the best of your ability. But you're also able to optimize your fertility, to monitor your menstrual cycle health, your hormonal health, to see where you're at. If you're coming off the pill, you can kind of see where you started from. And as the cycles go by and you're doing a variety of things to support your hormonal health and up your up your nutrient stores, restore some of those nutrient deficiencies that were caused by the pill, for example, et cetera, et cetera, you can actually see that progress. So if we go back to the study, I mean, it's telling us that there is this temporary period of subfertility that we should be aware of. But then what what do we do to manage that? And so of course, my suggestion is that we take this into consideration when we're considering when to come off birth control instead of just, you know, doing what we're apparently told by our healthcare professionals, which is to simply stay on them until the minute that before we're trying to get conceive and just assume everything's going to be fine. If we look at what the actual research says, it would indicate that it would be in our best interest to give ourselves a little bit of a buffer period. And so to come off before we're ready to try when we're still actively avoiding, but to then consider like, what are we going to do to prevent pregnancy while still preserving our fertility? So in Real Food for Fertility, in our pill chapter and also in our conception chapter. So chapters seven and eight, we go through this in a ton of detail. So all of this research and data we talk about in chapter seven, where we go through you know issues with the birth control pill and this question of when we should come off of contraceptives. And in chapter eight, we talk about the fertility awareness strategies for conception. We have a whole section where we go through non-hormonal birth control options, talk about what those options are. And it's not only fertility awareness. Fertility awareness, of course, is listed as one of the options, but we go through condoms, the controversial withdrawal question. We go through, you know, the diaphragm 
um, cervical cap, and you know, again, a variety of non-hormonal methods, and really talk through what some of those options are, because we want you to start thinking about your fertility. So not everybody necessarily has a whole bunch of lead time, but many of you do. Many of you do have it in your mind that you're planning to conceive within six months or a year or four months or two years or whatever the case is. Some of you aren't necessarily actively planning for a baby right now, but maybe you have hormonal issues and you're wanting to kind of figure this out. And so this is kind of like, again, like the third option so that we don't feel like it has to be one or the other. It doesn't just have to be, well, I'm off birth control and I'm just going to get pregnant whenever or I have to be on birth control um, until I'm, I'm actually ready to, to start trying. And it's unfortunate when you don't provide women with complete information about their cycles, it's like what we're doing instead is fostering a ton of fear around what's, what's going on. And we can't really make the best decisions out of fear. I'll just take a moment to read something from Real Food Fertility in the Pill chapter. In a separate study, not only did it take about twice as long for past oral contraceptive users to conceive compared to non-users, oral contraceptive users had a significantly lower chance of conceiving within the first six months after coming off the pill. This trend of reduced fertility continued for a full year after the participants had stopped taking oral contraceptives. And according to the researchers, We believe that women who plan to become pregnant should be aware of the possible, even though temporary, delay in their ability to conceive after the cessation of pill use. Furthermore, it has been accepted generally that couples could be considered for an infertility evaluation if they had tried unsuccessfully to conceive for at least 12 months after stopping all birth control methods. In view of the findings of this study, At least 15 months before an infertility evaluation might be an acceptable interval for prior pill users. So this is interesting in terms of what the researchers are suggesting. They're saying that this is showing us that there's a temporary period of subfertility after coming off contraceptives. And they're also saying that if that's true, then maybe we should be adjusting the recommendation for when we give someone an infertility evaluation. They're implying that if somebody is evaluated for infertility within this transition phase, they could be incorrectly identified as infertile, when if they took a little bit longer before they went that route, they might actually be okay. And so that's huge. That's huge. And so by no means am I suggesting that we delay medical care if we need it. You know, I do think it's important to seek support for fertility issues sooner than later, um, particularly on the male side, you know, at least for testing to see where we're at. But I do think it's important to consider that when we're in this period of subfertility, it could be that you appear that you have this problem when really your body's still in that transition and things could look differently several months later. So definitely a lot to consider there. One last point I want to make before we wrap up is that when we're looking at these types of studies as well, when we're looking at the time to pregnancy studies, it's useful to consider that when they're selecting candidates, they are typically screening out candidates that had pre-existing conditions or pre-existing menstrual cycle issues prior to partaking in the study. So anybody that had really irregular cycles or problematic cycles that were put on the pill for these reasons, often these participants are excluded from the study. And that also can be challenging because many women do have cycle issues and many women are put on contraceptives for managing those. And so if you're one of those people and the studies themselves exclude those people, then how do we know how it could affect you? And so I would argue that if you're put on the pill for specific menstrual cycle issues, then the pill doesn't actually solve or cure or fix those issues. It simply masks them and suppresses those symptoms so that you are now asymptomatic. You know, if you had a really, if you had 50, 70 day cycles, and then you're on the pill and you get a bleed every 28 days, well, that symptom is now gone. So yay. (laughs) But the actual issue that was causing your cycle to be like that was not solved. And so arguably, when you come off the pill, that issue is still going to be there. And so if that's you, then if you're planning to come off the pill to conceive, it's it's even more important that you come off sooner because you'll still have to address whatever it was that was causing your cycles to be irregular. So I hope that you enjoyed this three-part series. I certainly enjoyed putting it together. If you can think of someone who would benefit from hearing it, 
The link to share today's episode is fertilityfriday.com slash 512. And the three episodes in the series were 510, 511, and 512. So fertilityfriday.com slash 510 or et cetera. Uh, So if you know somebody who would benefit from hearing this, please feel free to share. If you are wanting to dig into the research, you can head over to the show notes page. Again, fertilityfriday.com slash 512. For more FAM research series episodes, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash research. And of course, to dive in more to this question of how to optimize fertility, make sure to grab your copy of Real Food for Fertility on Amazon. And you can find additional details about the book over at realfoodforfertility.com. So with that, I am going to wrap this episode. I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. And that's a wrap. If you're loving our FAM research series, then I know you'll love our Fertility Awareness Mastery Mentorship Program. It's a nine-month immersive experience that will completely transform the way you work with clients allowing you to not only teach fertility awareness to your clients, but to use the menstrual cycle as a vital sign and diagnostic tool in your women's health practice. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash famlive to join the waiting list and be the first to know when registration opens up again. There's no program like this offered anywhere. Transform your practice in nine months. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M-M-L-I-V-E.